Most people are waiting for their life to change so they can feel gratitude, to feel abundance, to mm -hmm. feel whole. You know, that's the old model of cause and effect, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you're living with emptiness, you're living with lack, you're living with pain, most people have been conditioned that something out there has to take away this emptiness or feeling inside of them. But if you believe that you're creating your life and you're living by lack, well, lack isn't going to create abundance, right? Mm. So, so then it makes sense then that you don't really actually create wealth, you generate wealth, you oh, generate wow. abundance. So the moment you start teaching your body emotionally what that future is going to feel like before it's made manifest, well, your body is the unconscious mind, mm. believes it's living in that future in the present moment. Now, it's a scientific fact that it's the environment that signals the gene. The end product from an experience in the environment is an emotion. So when you begin to embrace an elevated emotion, you're beginning to signal the gene ahead of the environment. What's the importance of that? Well, genes make proteins, and proteins are responsible for the structure and the function of your body. Mm. And the expression of proteins is the expression of life. So by you creating an elevated emotion and teaching your body what that future will feel like before it's made manifest, your body's starting to live in that future reality in the present moment. Now here's the key. If you were able to become familiar with gratitude, become familiar with wholeness, become familiar with abundance, to become familiar with freedom, mm -hmm. and you're able to generate those chemicals every single day, more than likely you would be walking around feeling like your future has already happened and you would no longer be looking for it to happen. You would already feel like it has happened. Now, what is the importance of that? Well, you're literally becoming somebody else. So you're leaving your lack. You're leaving your guilt, you're leaving your emptiness behind. Your personality, literally, Ed, is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. And how you think, how you act, and how you feel is your personality, and your personality is intimately connected to your personal reality, your life. So then if you want to change your life, your personal reality, you got to change your personality. And here we go again, you got to start becoming conscious of your unconscious thoughts. You gotta start noticing how you act, how you speak. You gotta pay attention to how you're feeling. Some people would live in guilt their whole entire life and don't even know it's guilt because at least it feels like them. So then when you start doing that, you begin to objectify your subjective self. So, so then when you begin to make small changes back to thought, yeah. a new thought should lead to a new choice. A new choice should lead to a new behavior. A new behavior should create a new experience, and a new experience should create a new emotion. Yes. And that new emotion is teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. Now your body is embodying the truth. I believe in human possibility, human potential, and I think that one of our biggest limiting beliefs is the belief of how limited we really are. And so my interest is to give people the science to begin to understand how powerful they really are. And I think that science really is the language that does that really well. And, and the new sciences like quantum physics and uh, neuroplasticity, neuroscience, neuroendocrinology, you know, uh, psychoneuroimmunology, the mind-body connection, epigenetics, all of those sciences point the finger at possibilities. So I want to create a language for people from a philosophical or theoretical standpoint for them to begin to understand what's possible. But then I want to be able to have those people begin to wire that information in their brain completely because learning is making new connections right in the brain. But remembering is maintaining and sustaining those connections and it's so much easier to lose our vision than to remember it, right? So then we have to begin to hardwire the brain or install the neurological hardware in preparation for an experience. So the more people understand what they're doing and why, then the how gets easier. So I wanna then set up the conditions in an environment, in a, in a, in a workshop where people can begin to apply or personalize what they learn so that they can have an experience. An experience then further enriches the brain, but the prize of an experience is an emotion. And once you start feeling unlimited, once you start feeling abundant, once you start feeling worthy, now you're teaching your body chemically to understand what your mind is intellectually understood. So knowledge is for the mind and experience is for the body and people begin to embody the truth that philosophy. Now, if they can repeat it over and over again, it'll become innate in them, it'll become natural, second nature, it'll become easy, they'll begin to master that philosophy. So I want people to begin to understand that thoughts are 
very powerful. Feelings drive our thoughts and that they can begin to create a better life for themselves once they understand some of these principles. Your capability is constant, but how much of it you use depends upon the identity you have for yourself. For example, if you feel certain that you are an outgoing, outrageous person, you'll tap the resources of behavior that match your identity. Whether you see yourself as a wimp or a wild man, a winner or a wallflower, will instantly shape which capabilities you access. You may have read the book Pygmalion in the classroom, which details the dramatic change in students' performance when they become convinced that they are gifted. Time and again, researchers have shown that students' capabilities are powerfully impacted by the identities they develop for themselves as the result of teachers' belief in their level of intelligence. In one study, a group of teachers were told that certain students in their classes were truly gifted and to make sure that they challenged them to continue to expand. As can be expected, these children became the top achievers in their class. What makes this study significant is that these students had not actually demonstrated higher levels of intelligence. And in fact, some had previously been labeled poor students. Yet it was their sense of certainty that they were superior, which had been instilled by, by a teacher's false belief, that triggered their success. The impact of this principle is not limited to students. The kind of person other people perceive you to be controls their responses to you. Often this has nothing to do with your true character. For example, if a person sees you as a crook, even if you are an honest person and do good things, this person will search for the sinister motive behind your acts. What's worse is that after making a positive change, we often allow others in our environment who have not changed their image of us to anchor our own emotions and beliefs back into our old behaviors and identities. We all need to remember that we have tremendous power to influence the identities of those we care about most. The best effect of fine persons is felt after we have left their presence. Ralph Waldo Emerson. We all will act consistently with our views of who we truly are, whether that view is accurate or not. The reason is that one of the strongest forces in the human organism is the need for consistency. Throughout our lives, we've been socialized to link massive pain to inconsistency and pleasure to being consistent. Think about it. What labels do we attach to people who say one thing and then do another, who claim to be one way and then behave another? We call them hypocritical, fickle, unstable, unreliable, wishy-washy, scatterbrained, flaky, untrustworthy. Would you like to have these labels attached to you? Would you even like to think of yourself in this way? The answer is obvious. A resounding no as a result whenever we take a stand, especially a public stand, and state what we believe, who we are, or what we're about, we experience intense pressure to remain consistent with that stand, regardless of what that inflexibility may cost us in the future. Conversely, there are tremendous rewards for remaining consistent with our stated identities. What do we call people who are consistent we use words like trustworthy, loyal, steady, solid, intelligent, stable, rational, true blue. How would you like to have people consistently use these labels to describe them? It becomes irrevocably tied to your ability to avoid pain and gain pleasure. Life is a game we are all bound to lose. The man who looks for the morrow without worrying over it knows a peaceful independence and a happiness beyond all others. Whoever has said, I have lived receives a windfall every day he gets up in the morning. Confronting the worst case scenario saps it of much of its anxiety, inducing power. Happiness reached via positive thinking can be fleeting and brittle. Negative visualization generates a vastly more dependable calm. 
It is a ridiculous thing for a man not to fly from his own badness, which is indeed possible, but to fly from other men's badness, which is impossible. Hour by hour resolve firmly to do what comes to hand with dignity and with humanity, independence and justice. Allow your mind freedom from all other considerations. This you can do if you will approach each action as though it were your last, dismissing the desire to create an impression, the admiration of self, the discontent with your lot. See how little man needs to master for his days to flow on in quietness and piety. He has but to observe these few counsels and the gods will ask nothing more. When force of circumstance upsets your equanimity, lose no time in recovering your self-control and do not remain out of tune longer than you can help. Habitual recurrence to the harmony will increase your mastery of it. If you apply yourself to study, you will avoid all boredom with life. You will not long for night because you are sick of daylight. You will be neither a burden to yourself nor useless to others. You will attract many to become your friends and the finest people will flock about you. Life is neither a glorious highlight reel nor a monstrous tragedy. Every day is a good day to live and a good day to die. Every day is also an apt time to learn and express joy and love for the entire natural world. Each day is an apt time to make contact with other people and express empathy for the entire world. Each day is perfect to accept with indifference all aspects of being. Perhaps struggle is all we have because the God of history is an atheist and nothing about his world is meant to be. So you must wake up every morning knowing that no promise is unbreakable, least of all the promises of waking up at all. This is not despair. These are the preferences of universe itself. Verbs over nouns, actions over states, struggle over hope. And here are two of the most immediately useful thoughts you will dip into. First, that things cannot touch the mind. They are external and inert. Anxieties can only come from your internal judgment. Second, that all these things you see will change almost as you look at them, and then will be no more. Constantly bring to mind all that you yourself have already seen change. The universe is change. Life is judgment. Each of us is impermanent wave of energy folded into the infinite cosmic order. Acknowledgement of the fundamental impermanence of ourselves unchains us from the strictures of living a terrestrial life stuck like a needle, vacillating between the magnetic pull of endless desire and the terror of death. Once we achieve freedom from any craving and all desires and we are relieved of all titanic fears, we release ourselves from living in perpetual distress. Once we rid ourselves from any impulse to exist, we discover our true place in the universal order. The composition of our life filament is exactly right when we accept the notion of living and dying with equal stoicism. You have the power to strip away many superfluous troubles located wholly in your judgment and to possess a large room for yourself embracing and for the whole cosmos to consider everlasting time, to think of the rapid change in the parts of each thing of how short it is from birth until dissolution, and how the void before birth and that after dissolution are equally 